Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you, yes you, make your game dev dreams become a reality. Today's part 21 of the AI series in this special edition of the AI series coming to you from the Fairmont in Austin, Texas. You'll notice there's no whiteboards, no couch. We're in a hotel on vacation and we're still bringing you the AI series. This week, we're gonna take a look at how to implement a jump attack for our enemies. We're gonna set up the foundation for our enemies to learn skills over time, and then also how to structure skills so we can apply the same pattern to giving our enemies skills. This will be the first part of the mini series in the AI series about implementing skills for our enemies. So we're only gonna implement one and the foundation in this video, and that's gonna be the jump attack. In the next couple parts, we'll be doing something like a fire breath, an ice lance, and spawning a poison cloud at the player's location. So those are a couple of the skills that you can look forward to seeing in the next parts of the subseries. And before we go any further, I just want to give a huge shout out to everyone who's supporting me on Patreon right now. I really appreciate it. Every bit helps the channel grow, reach more people, add value to more people, and that means that more people are making their game development dream become a reality. If you want to help me in that cause, you can show your support on Patreon, patreon.com slash academy. You can get your name up on the screen, you can get a voice shout out, and some other cool perks. Since we're planning on making multiple skills, I'll right click in the project panel, create a new folder called skills, and in there I'll create a new C -sharp script called skill scriptable object, and then another C -sharp script called jump skill. If we open up the skill scriptable object, we'll make this extend the scriptable object class instead of the mono behavior, and we'll add in some variables that we think most or all skills will use. So I'll add in a public float cooldown and set that to 10 by default. That'll just be the delay between an enemy using this skill. A public int damage, a public int unlock level, meaning on which round should the enemy start using this skill. And we'll add some state management variables. A public bool is activating and a protected float use time. The use time will just be the last time that they use the skill so we can use the cooldown correctly and is activating will just be so that way we know we should not be activating another skill at the same time we're using this skill. Then I'll create a public virtual skill scriptable object called scale up for level so that way our skills can also scale except a scaling scriptable object scaling and an int level. This should be very familiar from the last few videos where we did enemy scaling. And in here, we'll do a skill scriptable object, scaled skill equals create instance of skill scriptable object. And I'll call scale up base values for level, pass in the scaled skill, the scaling, and the level, and then we'll just return the scaled skill because the skill scriptable object only has base values. And if you want to get really technical, you could define this as an abstract class and define this function as an abstract method instead of making it virtual with this implementation. We're never going to instantiate an instance of this class because we're going to always have some kind of different logic that needs to happen per skill. So this code we're writing here, we're probably never going to call. And that's why you might choose to make this an abstract class and also make this function be abstract. Marking it abstract means that every subclass has to implement this method in whatever way it needs to implement it. And that's really what's happening here. So you could and probably should implement it that way. That's just not what I did here. We'll then define a protected virtual void scale up base values for level that accepts a skill scriptable object as an instance we're going to operate on the scaling scriptable object scaling and then the int the level so this is going to be the base values where we set up the instance.name the instance.cooldown and we scale up the damage based on the scaling damage curve so that's instance.damage equals damage plus math f floor to int scaling dot damage curve dot evaluate at the current level and we reassign the unlock level to the instance we move this into its own function because we're going to override the previous function in every skill scriptable object but we always want this to be something that we can execute. Then we'll have a public virtual void use skill that accepts an enemy and a player. And in there, we'll just say is activating equals true. And I'll also make a public virtual bool can use skill that accepts an enemy player and a level. And we'll by default return level greater than equal to unlock level. So with this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna check for each skill scriptable object, can this skill be used? If it can, then we'll call use skill. And every skill will most likely have a slightly different determination whether they can or cannot use that skill. And definitely every skill scriptable object will have a different use skill. 
because otherwise they're the same skill. And with this foundation, we can do a lot of cool different things and we're gonna start taking a look at that in just a second. Before we open up the jump skill and start defining how will our jump attack work, let's open up the enemy so we can really see how the skill script or object that we just defined can be used. I think that's important to start with. Remember that the skills accepted a player and an enemy because a lot of skills we need to know the location of the player or maybe some status of the player. So we're going to keep that full player reference here on the enemy level. We'll also add in a public int level so we know which round this enemy spawned for because the skills need to know that to know if they're unlocked or not. We'll also create a public skill scriptable object array called skills and we're going to do something really basic in the update function we will loop over all of our skills so for int i equals zero i less than skills dot length i plus plus we'll check if we can use the current skill so if skills index by i dot can you skill passing in this the player and the level if that returns true then we're going to do skills index by i dot use skill and for our purposes i think this will be enough in your game you may consider making a separate script called like an enemy skill manager or something that will manage enemy skills in a more powerful way than what we're doing right here but just to get the concept i think this this is a good starting point now let's open up the jump skill and we'll make that extend the skill scriptable object class and we're going to add in some new variables that will affect how we should jump. I'll put in a public float min jump distance, set it to 1.5 by default, a public float max jump distance, set that to five by default, a public animation curve height curve, and a public float jump speed. So the min and max distance we'll use to determine if we're really close to the player, we probably don't wanna jump to them because we're already right there. And if we're too far, then our enemy can't jump to them because they're too far away and the enemy can't jump that far. So that's kind of how those two are gonna be used. The height curve is gonna be used so whenever we animate our position, we'll make them actually do a jump and we can control how tall they should be at which part of the jump and the speed will be how fast we do that jump. So we'll do a public override skill scriptable object scale up for level. We're overriding the scale up entry point because we need to create a jump skill instance. You'll notice we're not calling the base implementation. We actually want a jump skill instance, not a skill scriptable object instance because we want to call these functions where we can use skill and the use skill. But we're gonna do the same thing where we scale up the base value for level, passing in the instance, the scaling in the level, and then we'll assign all of the jump skill specific things like min jump distance, max jump distance, height curve, and jump speed, and then we return the instance. And then here, if you have some scaling that you need to apply, you can do this. Maybe they can jump farther at higher levels. I don't know, whatever you need to do. You can do that and define the scaling in the scaling triple object and then apply it here. We'll then do the public override bool, can you skill, taking the enemy, the player, and the level, We'll check if the base implementation tells us we can use a skill, then we'll do whatever specific logic we have in here. So then we'll get the distance from the enemy to the player, and we'll check if we're not activating a skill, if the use time plus the cooldown is less than the time, meaning if the last time we use a skill plus our cooldown, if it's later in the game time than that, then it's acceptable to use the skill again. And then we'll also check the distance if it's greater than the min jump distance and less than or equal to the max jump distance, then we're good to go. We'll return true. In any other case, we're going to return false. Then we'll define the public override void use skill that accepts the enemy and the player. And then I'm going to actually do enemy.start coroutine and pass in the coroutine function jump that accepts the enemy and the player. So scriptable objects themselves cannot start coroutines, but because we have a reference to a mono behavior, the enemy, we can tell the enemy to start a coroutine that we have defined in the scriptable object, and that will run attached to that mono behavior, attached to the enemy. We can still do all of the coroutine management where we can keep a reference to that coroutine and do things like stop it or whatever here. I'm not going to do any of that with this. I don't think that's necessary because we're just going to fire this off and it's going to control everything and then we're going to let it do its thing. So we'll go down and define that jump coroutine function, private i enumerator jump that accepts the enemy and the player. And what we're going to do in this is disable everything that the enemy is going to do because we want to control the enemy from this coroutine. So I'm going to do enemy.agent.enabled is false. 
enemy.movement.enabled equals false. And I'm going to set the enemy.movement.state to be enemy state using ability. And I know we haven't defined that state yet. So let's open up the enemy state. And at the very bottom, we'll just add a new value to this enumeration called using ability. We're going to use that so that way we can identify if the enemy is currently using an ability, then that's a distinct state for our enemy. Separate from the chasing, separate from being idle, it's an active state for them to be in. Then we'll go back to the jump skill. That's kind of all the initial just tell the nav mesh agent to stop doing anything because I'm going to control you right now. Then we'll get the starting position of the enemy. So vector three starting position equals enemy.transform.position. We'll then tell the enemy that, hey, we're going to do a jump. So we'll do enemy.animator.set trigger enemy movement.jump, which is a constant that we have there. But we actually need to make that a public const because right now it's private. So we'll go into the enemy movement and change it to be public const string instead of private. And then we can use it like how we just wrote. Coming back to the jump skill, we're going to move with the enemy position from wherever they started to wherever the player currently is. So they're going to follow the player with their jump. They're not just going to jump to wherever the player was at a given moment. I'll do for float time equals zero time less than one time plus equals time dot delta time times jump speed. And in there we'll do just the simple vector three lerp enemy transform position equals vector three lerp starting position player dot transform dot position passing in the time. And then we'll do the same thing like we did on the agent link mover where we add in vector three up times height curve dot evaluate time. So we'll be moving towards the player, but then adding in the additional height from the height curve. We'll then do enemy.transform.rotation to make sure that the enemy is looking at the player. And we'll do that with enemy.transform.rotation equals quaternion.slurp enemy.transform.rotation. And then for the second argument, we're going to pass in quaternion.lookrotation, taking the player transform position minus the enemy.transform position. And the third is still the time for the slurp. We're recalculating the look rotation every frame in this case, because we're we're constantly moving. If we cached it at the beginning, it wouldn't always be right. So that's why I'm recalculating on every frame. We'll then yield return null to let the next frame come around. And then we would keep following this loop until the enemy is at the same location as the player and looking at the player. Once I get there, we will do enemy.animator.set trigger enemy movement.landed. Only after we've done the jump am I going to assign use time to equal time.time. .time. That way the cooldown is the actual cooldown that starts kicking in after the skill has completed. I'll then re-enable everything we disabled a second ago. So that's enemy movement enabled is true and enemy agent enabled is true. I'll then do a nav mesh dot sample position with the player transform position passing out a nav mesh hit hit that I'm going to define in line. I'll put like a one for the radius and pass in the enemy agent area mask. And that should always give us something because the player's on the nav mesh, the enemy's on the nav mesh. This should give us something. We'll then warp the agent so that way the nav mesh agent understands where it is now because we manually moved it. This is really important. We're going to do enemy.agent.warp to the hit position. And then we'll reset the enemy movement state to be chase because maybe their default state is not chase. And whenever we re-enable the movement, they go back to the default state. So we want to reassign them to be the chase state. And the last thing to do on this script is add the create asset menu attribute to the jump skill. We'll put a file name of jump skill and a menu name of scriptable object slash skills slash jump. We have all this code about scaling up the scriptable objects, but we don't do that yet. So let's open up the enemy scriptable object. In here, we will define a public scale scriptable object array called skills. Then in the scale up for level function, we will say scaled up enemy dot skills equals new skill scriptable object array of size skills dot link. We'll then iterate over all the skills and say scaled up enemy dot skills index by i equals skills index by i dot scale up for level passing in the scaling and the level exactly the same as we did for the attack configuration but we're going to do it for every skill instead of just one skill. The last changes we need to make are in the enemy spawner. We currently have a public transform player that references the player but now our enemies need to know more about the player potentially so we'll have a public player player on the enemy spawner. We'll just change it from a transform to a player reference. And then we'll scroll down to where we do spawn enemy. In here, the enemy movement player needs just the transform. So we'll do player.transform. 
We'll also assign the enemy.level to be the level. We'll assign the enemy.skills to be the scale of enemies indexed by the spawn index.skills. And we'll assign the enemy.player to be the player. When we hop back to the Unity editor, in the project panel, I'll now do right click, create scripto object skill jump called jump skill. I'm going to leave the cooldown as 10, the damage we actually aren't using. So we'll leave that alone. The unlock level we'll leave at 1 because I want them to start using this immediately. This activating is mostly for reading purposes, so we're going to leave that alone. Min max jump distance I'll also leave alone. So I'll define a height curve, be a simple parabola. I'll then select the basic enemy scriptable object. Give them one skill, the jump skill. I'll then select the enemy manager, drag the player reference because we've changed that and we lost the reference because it's not a transform anymore. I'll change the enemy spawn method to be round robin, make there be only one enemy to spawn so that way I'm only going to get that basic enemy so we can really just focus on this basic enemy doing that jump. If I then click play, see the enemies on the second floor so I'll wait for them to come down to me. and we can see them jump to me off the stairs and then they keep chasing me. So I'll run away a little bit, wait for that cooldown to come back. I'll try to stay in the general range. And there they go again, jumping right to me. So I think that's that's pretty cool. We got the jumping seal working correctly. It will scale up that we didn't make this jump do any damage, it's more like a movement ability. And so in the next video, I'm actually gonna go and create some new cool attacks that these enemies will use. I hope you got a lot of value out of today's video and you understand how to implement the scriptable objects that we did for skills and the concepts behind them so that you can implement your own skills while you're waiting on next week's video to come out to show you how to do something like a channeled fire breath. If you have been getting value out of this video or the series, please consider liking and subscribing to help the channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people. This new video is posted every Tuesday and sometimes on other days too. If you have any questions, if you have a suggestion for a topic, or if you're implementing AI into your game, drop a comment down below and I'll see you on the next video.